Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's TPC webinar entitled Understanding How to Read a Pump Curve. My name is Ryan Smith, and I am joined here today by Ralph Stevens, our expert TPC instructor. Uh, he teaches all things for TPC, from electrical to HVAC to mechanical systems, and he's been doing this work for 45 years, so he's a real expert in this field. He's going to tell us all about um, the ins and outs of reading a pump curve for our use in the industry. Um, before we get into some of the details and we hand it over to Ralph, I'd like to just go over a couple of quick things about today's webinar. The first thing is that this webinar is being recorded. And because of that, uh, you'll be free to watch back that recording on our website, the TPC website, um, free for your use uh, within about two business days from this event. So be on the lookout for the link to that recording, as well as we're going to capture the PDF of these slides as well that you can download. So you don't have to worry about taking a picture on your cell phone or something like that. Um, and then also, this since this is a free public event right now, this is a free public event, um, there, there's not going to be anything like a certificate of completion or anything like that. I know we tend to get some of those questions before, but um, this hopefully can be a seed and a feeder for you into um, other forms of training that you do get a uh, official certi certificate of completion and attendance for those. And then finally, this session is live today in the moment. So because of that, let's feel free to interact with the instructor today. Um, and to do so, you see there's a few options at the bottom, but I want you to not focus necessarily on that chat window, but do focus on that Q&A button. Uh, the Q&A button is really where we can answer all of our questions and answers for the uh, for Ralph here, and we'll be able to monitor them. I'll monitor them on your behalf, and we'll be able to answer them at the end of the session. So definitely please do use that uh, Q&A button to ask any questions and curiosities about the topics of pumps and pump curves during today's session. And finally, before I hand it over to Ralph, we would like to learn a little bit more about who's here today. And in doing so, uh, we're going to launch a little poll with one single question for you that's going to pop up on your screen right now. So you should see a question showing up on your screen that's asking this one question, and that is, how comfortable are you right now with reading and understanding pump curves? really the topic of today's webinar. How comfortable are you coming into this session on your ability to read pump curves? You can be fully honest. That's really what learning is all about, right, is, is building skills. So we're seeing some really great questions come in. Excellent. And uh, we'll give you just a couple more seconds. So are you very comfortable with your abilities? Are you somewhat comfortable with reading and understanding pump curves? Are you neutral, somewhat uncomfortable, or very uncomfortable? Um, and kind of new to it, let's say, on, on reading and understanding pump curves. Okay, I think we got a good amount of answers. I'm going to go ahead and end this poll. And I'm going to share the results with everyone. And as we're seeing here, you all, we have a wide variety of experience at the table today, and it's really that normal distribution curve all across the map. So um, people range from very comfortable to very uncomfortable and across the map. And really, it's the average is falling right in the middle. You're kind of somewhere between comfortable and uncomfortable on reading pump curves. 31% of you. Follow closely that, again, evenly, 26% uh, of you are somewhat comfortable, 26% of you are somewhat uncomfortable reading pump curves. So it's all across the map, and I think this is a really good reason for taking one of these um, webinars and getting more training in general on mechanical is to help build the skills to feel that very comfortable um, feeling of, of reading pump curves. So I'm going to stop this share. And from here, let's go ahead and get started. So we're going to hand it over to Ralph here to tell us a little bit more about reading a pump curve. Thank you so much for being here, Ralph. Yeah, not a problem. I wish uh, I'm so happy everybody could be here. Um, so today I'd like to talk about uh, pump curves. Uh, please know that um, uh, this is, this is going to be about centrifugal pumps. There's also system pump curves or progressive cavity pump curves. And there's also a variable speed uh, pump curve that if you're using a VFD or something like that. I'm going to give you some uh, ideas about that and stuff. But there's this, this talking about a pump curve will we'll go across the board. All right, but this today I want to talk about centrifugal pumps and stuff like that. Okay, and and just just know that, I, you know, like I said, Ryan was uh, very nice on the introduction. Thank you so much. I um, I've been around for a long time, older older gent, old school. So um, like I said, I've we've blown up more things than most people have 
put everybody on this call and put together. Okay, so not a big deal, right? Uh, I would say say that if it rotates, we can fix it. So this is one of the things I've been doing all, all my life, and it's really never really took the time. First 15, 20 years of I didn't really care about a pump curve because I didn't know anything about it. But as I learned different things and how it affects things that we do, that's that was the key to me. So so let's just start off by talking about what's up there right now, pump curve 101. And typically, all we really care about is total dynamic head, which 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 we're going to cover and everything. And then across that goes up on the left hand side here going up and going down across the bottom would be gallons per minute. So it's like, hey, if I if I call a a a a place for a pump. I'm going to say, hey, uh, I need uh, 100 gallons a minute at uh, 10 or 100 foot of head. And they're going to look on some crazy chart and say, okay, yep, yep, this is what you need. Here you go. Thank you very much. And they ship it to me and I put it in or whatever. Or I do a replacement. And when I do the replacement, um, I tend never to look at the curve. I just look at the look at the nameplate and say, I need a new one, right? So, so thinking about that, um, I started looking into how to read a curve and everything and, and was very enlightened about how, how the pump is affected by other things. And this pump curve would tell me that. So first thing to talk about is a system curve. A system curve is basically all my pipes and valves in my system. And what does that mean to my pump? So elevation wise, we're gonna talk about and, and also the size of the pipe and what kind of pipe is made out of because of its cast iron or PVC and so, there's different friction losses and stuff as we go through a through the pipe and also through a valve and stuff. So that's part of my system curve. The proportional pressure curve is if I have a valve in there that I close or partially close, I should say, um, what does that do to my curve in general or what happens to my pump? So know that all, all valves and everything should be wide open. And that is what the pump curve is built on, okay? Along with that is this happens to be a constant speed pump curve. So it's a centrifugal constant speed. I'm gonna run at full speed, 1800 RPMs, 3600 RPMs, whatever it says on the nameplate of the pump motor combination. And then there's a thing called a duty point. And a duty point is actually the point at which um, my pump is working across the board. Everything is great, right? And we're going to show you that too, talk about that too. The duty point also is sometimes uh, mentioned as a BEP, which is the best efficiency point. And we'll talk about that in a second here. So there's another curve. And this starts, I'm going to start breaking down what the curve actually means to me and stuff like that, okay? So this is just like that other curve that we just had. Know that the puff, pump efficiency is usually somewhere between uh, 75% and 85% is, is where I'm, I'm, really, I'm really feeling pretty good about myself, okay? And if I go to one side or the other that, I start having problems, right? We're going to talk about that too in a second. But this one here is showing that the green line is my, I'm doing what I should do. Everything's going great. And I'm at 82% 82, 82 efficiency right? Valve is full open, everything's good. But when I partially close that valve, know that I start drifting, the red line, the B starts drifting off to the other side, my pump efficiency drops to 77%. And this could just be a, a little bit of a closed thing. So typically, what we used to do is that if the pump is running and everything and the pump is tripping out because it's overloading or overheating or something like that, I would go to my discharge valve, close it a little bit, Okay, and it, and, it, and it starts working a lot better, right? It's because my efficiency has gone down. I'm asking the pump to do a little bit less work, but yet I'm affecting what happens in my system, right? Not a good idea to do anymore, but uh, uh, that's how you find out these things, right? So as we close a valve and stuff like that, the pump efficiency starts to drop off, okay? And then we have, we're going to talk about static head and some operating points also, but this just gives you an idea of what's starting to happen in your system when you do partially close to fully open. So this is the big, the big elements of a pump curve that everything that, we're, that is built into this pump curve at, at one time. So just to start at the top here and stuff like that, we have, uh, we have a flow on that left-hand side going up, right? And that kind of tells us what is the shutoff head maximum. Uh, and, and it goes to show you like, if you had a, 
a basement and you had a little sump pump down there in the basement or something like that. And it was a, a third horse or a half horse, a little pump or something. And it, fa- you know, it blew up, failed, whatever. And it's storming out and everything. You run to Home Depot, you buy another one and you put it in and you just buy because, hey, it was a half horse, I'm buying a half horse. Or it was a third horse, I'm buying a third horse and everything should be fine. But did you ever think about looking at the pump curve, even on a small pump like that? When you look at that and it tells you, hey, it's 100 gallons per minute, right? That's pretty good. That's pretty good. That's what it says on the outside of the box. And you're like, hey, that's, that's, that's great. I can, I can really use that. Problem is that's 100 gallons per minute at zero time, total dynamic head. And so as if I have a 10-foot basement, let's say an 8-foot basement, and I have a 2-foot hole that I'm putting a sump pump down into, and then I'm pumping outside, and so I have 10 foot, and at 10 foot, that 100 gallons per minute is now 5 gallons per minute, all right? Um, the The problem that happens is, straight across the board, is my how much flow do I have coming out? Right, so my my everything that's coming out is going to be a is going to be a problem. Okay, so that's kind of what I look at as I go across on this pump curve and everything. Okay, so that's on one side of it. The other side is 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 the look at the blue lines there where it says preferred operating region. That's somewhere between the 75 and 85 percent. All right, and that says specified duty point. Again, that's my best efficiency point, because I want to be somewhere inside there and usually right there in the middle. And I'll show you some other curves here at at the end and stuff. We're going to go over this even more, but that is the sweet spot. And I love that one because if you ever swing a a baseball bat and hit a baseball, all right, if you, if I throw you a pitch and you hit it and the, and it's right in that sweet spot of the bat, you don't feel anything and the ball just goes and it's gone. No, no, you don't, it's just like a perfect swing, all right? But let's say you hit it off the end of the bat or you hit it off your your hands, you know, because it's a tight pitch or something like that. It either breaks the bat or spins off someplace, doesn't go past the pitcher and stuff like that, blah, blah, blah. It's all bad stuff. Same thing, same thing with a, with, with this pump curve is that if I go too far one way to, to the left, let's say, I start to cavitate. And I'll cover cavitation too, but I start to cavitate, which is bad, okay? But, and if I run to the other side of the pump curve, going towards what people think is 100%, but it actually starts going down again in in, uh, percentages of efficiency, I start, my flow starts suffering and stuff like that. Because my flows, I start um, not giving the flow needed to what I was specified to do. Okay, kind of like the thing, hey, 100, 100 gallons per minute at zero and 10 gallons at 10 feet, and I need 50 gallons to empty my basement, otherwise it's gonna flood. That's my problem, okay? Um, also on here, they're talking about NPSH and with a little R on it and stuff like that. That's called net positive suction head required. If it had an A on it, it'd be available, right? So those two terms are important to us when we're picking a pump and looking at the curve and stuff like that, because if I have what's called a flooded suction pump, right? And we'll cover that also. But the idea is I want to give you all, I want this, I want to cover all the indicators and all the definitions here in the first couple of slides so that when we start getting into it, you'll have a better understanding. But this this net positive suction head required is every pump needs a minimum amount of flow being, because does a pump suck? And, and it does to a certain extent, it has to be fed too. So, so as water's coming into the pump, into the eye of the impeller, things start to happen. So if I starve it, which I don't have enough suction head required to available, if I don't give it enough, I start, I start cavitating, okay, on my pump and stuff. So we're gonna cover that. Then there's this power curve. The power curve is pretty cool because it tells you what size motor that you should have in there or a driver, as it's called, in order to turn the pump. All right. So as you're looking at, say, okay, what size motor do I need to actually drive this pump to make it pump 300 gallons a minute? Okay. And it's always when it gets close to, when we get close to that line, which I'll show you, when you get close to that line, I always tend to jump to the next size motor because it's gonna work. The motor should last you 20 years, but it's only lasting five years and burning up because you're making it work too hard, all right? 
that's something to think about. And everything. So we're covering some stuff on that. So that that's the power curve is all about motors and stuff, right? This uh, maximum diameter curve that's shown at the top blue line there, and, or the middle blue, blue line there and stuff like that, that tells you what size of impeller that you should use in order to, to, to sit there and say, okay, this is this, everything is set up correctly. And that, that covers how much, how much water am I going to pump and things like that. And, and naturally too, we don't always just pump water, right? So we might be pumping chemical or gasoline or whatever. So we're going to talk about that too, but this is everything that's on this, on this curve that we should think about, but yet we never really, you know, it's like, okay, what does this mean type thing? So, so with that, that's some basic terms to understand, okay? The pump curve, it denotes flow on the x-axis horizontal and head pressure on the y, the vertical. The curve begins at the point of zero flow and or shutoff head goes all the way up to, to zero because, hey, I can only pump 30 feet. It's gonna be, that's, it, it's gonna stop. I can't pump anymore. If I got 40 feet of pipe, I'll go up to 30 feet and sit there and nothing comes out the other end, right? And it gradually descends until it reaches the pump runout point on maximum flow rate. So the same thing on the other side, how much flow can I go? The more flow that you're asking for, 100 gallons, like I said, with that, with that sub pump, I can only do it at zero. That doesn't do me any good. So, so that, that again is what, how that pump curve is set up, okay? Very easy, two easy points for you to look at. The BEP, is the pump's operating sweet spot or best efficiency point. Like I said, am I hitting the baseball in the sweet spot, right? And it's generally located near the middle of the curve. Pumps are most efficient and have their highest life expectancy when they can run near their BPE, I'm sorry, BEP, and as determined by the manufacturer. So the manufacturer, the nice thing about a manufacturer, he designs all this, he uses a hydraulic listing and stuff off of off our hydraulic books and everything and says, hey, the pump that I made will do what you're asking it to do, all right? The thing I don't um, guarantee is that it, it will give you the output in your system, all right? So, so and my, on my testing unit here, it gives you everything that you're asking for, but because your system curve, it still might not operate correctly. Okay. And then so typically the area of the curve between 70 and 120% of your uh, best um, efficiency um, uh, point is known to be a preferred, preferred operating region uh, for the pump. Your efficiency curve, all right, the pump efficiency curve represents a pump's efficiency across its entire operating range. All right, so it's a whole thing and, and it's expressed in percentages on the right hand of the curve that, that BEP is represented by the efficiencies curves peak. And when the efficiency declines across it and arcs the other way, right or left from it, knowing that efficiency percentages will also help calculate the horsepower required for the application. So as you, as you get out of that sweet spot, like I said, it's gonna change size and type of motor possibly for that or driver for that pump, right? Because sometimes it could be an air driven or, or electrical or whatever, but it's going to tell you in horsepower, it's called water horsepower. How much water horsepower do I need to make this pump turn? Then we have these, it's called ISO efficiency lines. It's an ISO is the International Organization for Standardization. And those lines are conceptually elliptical curves indicating equal efficiency on a pump curve. So we have a standard. People don't make up their own, you know, own lines and stuff like that. This is a standard across the industry that they came out with and said, hey, I have, I have these, uh, this pump curve is a standard curve. Now you fill in your, your things to it. They are used as another means of representing how efficiency levels change along a pump curve as it moves away from that sweet spot or if the impeller diameter is reduced because typically a volute Let's say it's a 12 inch volute, which is the outside pump casing, all right? Um, and it's, I could put a nine inch, a nine and a half, a 10 inch, a 10 and a half, 11 inch impeller inside there to change a lot of different things for how, what I need to pump and stuff like that. So again, uh, that's, that's all gonna be on our pump curve here at the end here and stuff. And we're gonna get a better idea of how do we size everything. The power curve represents the load 
the pump imposes on a driver at a given point on the pump curve and helps us make sure we got the proper motor sizing, okay? It's represented as a separate curve graph and gradually rises toward the peak load. And once we get typically pretty close to that, that's why we want to, we want to figure out if we're at the right size of, of driver or motor. And that is typically close to the, to the sweet spot with the most rotor dynamic pump type. So there's, like I said, there's all different type of pump, pump types. And uh, today we're talking about this centrifugal, but um, know that they're, they're all pretty, uh, shows everything's um, uh, put out in water horsepower, okay? And after, and afterwards, as it, it declines at, as it approaches the runout point, right? Because I can only go 3,600 RPM or 1,800 RPM and stuff like that. And as, and as I'm, I get to that top end there and stuff like that, if I'm not sized right, what happens is I, I start my percentage of efficiency is coming down and also my flow is going to change or come pretty much reduce. So here's one of my favorites. This is the net positive suction head required. Okay. The net positive suction head required indicate, and this is typically with the, with the little baby R there and stuff like that, or sometimes you'll th see a three on there. It's typically 3% less across the board as is taken off because of the pieces of the pump and everything that are rotating and everything. We lose 3% off the top. So that's why you'll never see a pump curve that's 100% can't be, okay? So depending on the type of pump and, and the impeller and then what you're pumping and everything else, this is all part of it and stuff, just so you know, okay? And that indicates how much force is needed to push liquid into the eye of the pump impeller and knowing the correct amount of net positive suction head required will prevent the pump from cavitating, vibrating, and failing prematurely. So if we if we know what's supposed to be there and how much is how much is there already, and how can we tell how much is there already? By having a pressure gauge there, a vacuum gauge, pressure gauge, and we'll talk about that in a second too. So and it's a minimum amount of pressure required on a suction side of the pump, right? Suction side is the eye side. And then the discharge side is coming off of the off the top of the pump, typically. Then we have net positive suction head available, right? So, th and this is the difference. Typically, we need five feet difference of head pressure from available to required as a minimum. I like to have a little bit more, but that's a minimum for the pump. And that is determined by the process piping, the size of, the, of that piping, if we have a flooded suction of the pump, all this stuff is, is tied in together. And the net positive suction head available should always be greater than what is required to avoid performance problems on a pump. So obviously, that's why I said a minimum is five, uh, five feet of, of pressure, which is a little bit over 10 PSI. So we'll talk about that in a second too. This is, one of, this is one of my favorites. It's total dynamic head, or TDH or total dynamic head, is the amount of head or pressure on the suction side of the pump. This is also called static lift. And the height that fluid is to be pumped plus the friction loss of internal pipe roughness or corrosion. Because inside of our pipe, we get corrosion, all right? So that all stops things from moving, all right? Or make it harder to pump. My total dynamic head is equal to my static height plus my static lift plus my friction loss. The static lift is the height of the water will rise before arriving at the suction side of the pump. That's one. Static height is the maximum height reached by the pipe on the discharge side of the pump. So guess what? How high do I, we're, I'm at uh, 20 feet below ground and I'm pumping up 10 feet. That, that number is important, okay? And then friction loss are losses due to type of pipe valves thing, things like that. Using a, uh, a steel, um, four inch steel to a four inch plastic PVC to a cast iron or something, all of those require a different, it will give, it will give you a different number. There's a mathematical equation in the hydraulics book and stuff like that of how to figure all this out. But in, in across the board, everything that you pump through or go through a valve, a check valve, a, a you know, gate valve, anything like that, 
there is a loss, friction loss, because you're, you're forcing it to go through there, changing sizes, things like that, whatever. That will also matter. Cavitation, and that's one of my favorites because cavitations, if I ask people all the time, I said, what do you think cavitation? And they said, well, it's air in the line. I said, well, yes and no, okay? So the formation of bubble, vapor bubbles, because what happens is your liquid, whatever you're pumping, when it hits, when it, cavitation happens, it's because there's a vapor, it, the, the liquid turns into a vapor because the pressure has changed. And it's usually a vacuum pressure Okay, so if you have a, and that's why I said it's very important that we have gauges on all on everywhere on our on our system. Okay, because as I have a suction or a vacuum, uh, things things start could start bad bad things start happening. Okay, so those vapor bubbles in liquid develop in areas where pressure falls below the vapor pressure of the liquid. The imploding or collapsing of these bubbles as they move to higher pressure areas in the pump, triggers an intense shock wave in the pump. Sounds like rocks. I know people say, well, it sounds like rocks and stuff like that. But the thing to know is that little implosion, okay? It's an implosion, not an explosion. It causes significant damage to the impeller and your pump housing, okay? Because it'll, it'll actually mark into it because it's, it's thousands of PSI when it, when it implodes and it actually dents or possibly could um, have, Give you a a, a a crack in your in your uh, unit. Density density is something that people really don't think about too much, I think, because it's a density of a fluid or is its mass per unit of volume, and is usually expressed in pounds per gallon. So does does things in your uh, does does your item a uh, fluid float or sink? Gasoline a little bit lighter in water floats. All right, uh, mercury. A lot heavier, it sinks, okay? Next thing is specific gravity. Now this is, this is something because the ratio of the density of a fluid of what water is at standard conditions, water is always rated at one at 68 degrees Fahrenheit. What do you think happens when we go to 40 degrees Fahrenheit or 300? Well, if I expand, if, if I'm boiling or something like that, I, I get less dense, I'm easier, I'm easier to pump. But let's say I go to 40 and I start condensing, like let's take water for instance, and I start, I be, I start becoming a, a piece of ice, I'm very hard, it's a lot harder to work to make me move. So just know that all pumps are rated at the viscosity of one, right? Density and specific gravity make viscosity. It's rated at one and it's at 68 degrees Fahrenheit. So if you're pumping something that is 300 degrees, like it's a chemical or something, or you're pumping gasoline or something like that, it changes all of your, the, the, whole, the whole curve. So you just can't say, hey, call, the, call, call and get another replacement pump, all right? Got to know why or what you need. Head is the height to which a pump can raise water straight up. Water creates pressure at, or resistance at predictable rates. So we can calculate head as a different pressure that is a pump has to overcome in order to raise that amount of water. Common units are per, pounds per square inch. There's a pump curve calculator that could be in bar or meters, depending on if it's a metric or, you know, if it's made over in Europe or something like that. But here in the United States, we go 2.31 feet of head equals one PSI on our gauge. And then flow is the volume of water a pump can move at a given pressure. Flow is indicated on a horizontal axis across the across the bottom of your curve, and it ends in gallons per minute or gallons per hour. So let's talk about feet to psi. If you took one foot cubed of of a uh, of water, okay, turns out to be 60, 62, uh, about sixty two uh, pounds or twenty three point one feet of if you cut these into uh, 144 pieces and stuff like that. That's how they figured this all out, but it ends up being 2.31. So if we have 23 feet of water divided by 2.31 of pressure, it should give us 10 PSI on a gauge. So how many feet of head would be create pressure of 130 PSI? So if you had a big gallon of tank up on top there and stuff, and it's, you know, how much, how much pressure should, is it correct? So my formula would be PSI times 2.31 
uh, feet. And so 130 times 2.31 feet PSI tells me I have 300 feet of pressure on one side of me, 300 feet of water. What is a total dynamic head and a flooded suction uh, idea is that we take, we could take the center line of the pump. And if, if, if my flooded suction, which means my water, my incoming water is above the center line of my pump, I now, my static, my static head discharge and everything changes everything because now I could pump farther because I don't have to lift this water on the, on the suction side. It's provided to me. So if that 300 gallon tank that was on the last slide was, was sitting up on top and this is below or at, or at the bottom of the pump, I have all that flooded suction to help me push. So I, I don't have to work as hard. But if I have flooded uh, vacuum suction, which means, hey, this, my strain is below me, below my pump, I then have my di total dynamic head decreases because I have to add all of this section here. I have some suction loss at the beginning here at the bottom. I have to figure how many feet am I pulling the water up to the center line of my pipe or my pump, I should say, and then my discharge lift. So I have to add these two together so that means I, I could possibly lose, you know, you know, 15 to 20 feet because I can only pull on average, I can only pull about 22 feet uh, on my suction side and on a single veined pump. There's multiple veins and single single veins, but on a single vein pump, which is your typical, typical uh, um, Centrifugal pump, you only have one blade in there, one, one impeller, that's what happens. So if you get pretty good pump information or it's lacking and stuff like that, this one here is a Gould one. It tells me to, my impeller diameter, but it, it tells me RPM, but it doesn't tell me my, how many total dynamic head I got or gallons per minute. So it's really hard to say, hey, I got to replace this. What I got to replace it with? This is a little bit better one. It's a Bell and Gossett one. It tells me how many gallons per minute I have to have. It tells me how many feet in my head is, uh, horsepower, things like that. So I could take and make sure that the one I'm replacing is good enough or why or better than the one that's in there, right? So these are these are why pressure gauges are important. If I'm pulling down here on the left hand side here, they have centrifugal pump system. If I'm pulling, if water is coming down here to feed my suction valve and I'm pushing out, I could take my total dynamic head, which let's say it's a, a hundred and divide that by the pressure here being put out my discharge valve, take my pressure gauge here. And if it says, hey, I've got uh, you know, uh, 30 PSI, I, I can divide that into my into this and tell me how many feet I'm actually pumping up and everything, just to, just to make sure that I'm in that pump curve and stuff. That's why valve, valves, and, and, and putting uh, good pressure gauges on both sides are really, really key to my, to my figuring everything out that's happening in my system. On the right-hand side here, this is the opposite. It's, it's sucking, it's doing a suction one, uh, it's flooded. Uh, and this valve here, the first one after this valve with this pressure gauge, this is gonna be a, gonna be a, a vacuum gauge. It's gonna be a, a, something that's telling me because I'm sucking, I'm sucking up, I'm creating a vacuum. And if I go past five, Five to seven on my on my vacuum, I'm going to have a problem because I'm going to start cavitating. Okay, and again, we have a, a gauge here on my on my output or my discharge side to tell me, hey, is everything here that I'm that's going through here? And I could use these two, I can use those two gauges to tell me a lot of good information. All right. Okay, so things to be wary of: impeller sizes, trimming. It's called impeller trimming. Trimming is done to match the operating points. Where, what size do I need to put in there, right? Trimming the impeller results in a change in the length and outlet angle of the flow at discharge. So know that if you put a different size impeller, it's gonna change everything in your system. Valves, valves should always be operated at fully open position. Semi-open or closed valves change your output, obviously, especially a closed valve, right? You could blow your pump up. Or the discharge valve is closed and you don't know it and you turn the pump on and run and it can't pump. It starts boiling the water inside there and it'll, it'll, it'll blow out everything in your pump. Knowing your pipe sis, piping system, you need to have five to 10 diameters of straight piping on the suction side and your suction side pumping should be oversized to reduce friction losses. That's why it's always bigger or should be. Eccentric reducers used correctly um, 
and we'll talk about that in a second, but they should be used correctly. And then you have to watch where you place your 90 degree elbows. If you place them too close, you have a problem. Your impellers, your impellers are really wild because the eye of the impeller is only sucks it in at about three point, about three PSI. But as I wring this out here and I always push, I never cup, I push. And when I push this out, when the red out here on the edge where it's going up and out your volute and up and out your discharge is closer to 90, I can go from three to 96 PSI by just running this pump and it's the right veins and everything else. Because due to spinning action on the impeller veins, the fluid near the impeller exit is thrown out. This causes all the fluid to slide radi out radially and a void is formed in the center. So it's just like a hurricane. It's just like a tornado, right? The center is really calm. The outside's doing all the work. Fluid in the inlet pipe at the pressure side is always higher than the eye. And it, as, it, as it's getting pushed into the eye and as this process, process proceeds, uh, constant flow is established through the pump because that makes my vacuum and creates pump suction. You could have an open impeller, the open impeller types, there's different, three different types of impellers, but the two that are typically used are either an opener or a semi-open, right? There's also what's called the closed. Closed, closed one is usually typically used if you just pump water in a water system. Uh, a, this type here is used if, if you don't really, if you have a lot of rags or something, you're trying to pump something out of a wastewater treatment plant or something like that, a lot of times is an open impeller. And then we have a semi-open, which puts a back, uh, back plate on the open impeller. And this is usually the one that you see like in sub pumps and things like that. So real, uh, on your suction and discharge piping, this is an e uh, concentric and this is eccentric. The middle one is eccentric, but the proper selection and the way we, the way we, how we line up our piping matters, okay, so that you don't get air bubbles or vapor buildup, okay? So here on your suctions coming from the top, you have an elbow, you need five to 10 diameters of your pipe after this elbow before you hit the eccentric condu uh, reducer, which on this instance would have a flat bottom here with the angle at the top coming into the pump before it goes through up the discharge. Again, if you, this is suction side pumping now, okay? If, if I'm sucking, all right, from the top or here's my elbow, I, I need 10 diameters of straight pipe. And, it's, and depending on the size of your pipe and everything else, it would, it's gonna matter how much room I have for, for my pump and pressure gauges here and stuff like that. So this is the correct way of, if you're sucking from the bottom, your eccentric conducer has a flat top raise with an angled bottom, okay? If it's coming from the top, I have a flat bottom and and concentric or eccentric uh, angle at the top of this one to keep the bubbles, everything in flow, okay? So concentric, eccentric should be set up correctly. Things we wary of, so this here is a little pump station here. And if I came down into here and I had a, and I put a quick 90 right on my, my, on my discharge, got a problem because I'm sucking here from something, okay? Coming through the wall, coming up and going through here and I put a quick 90 with a, with a, a ball check here or some type of check valve and stuff like that coming out. I put a lot of, lot of, and there's no, and there's no valve and no pressure gauges or anything here to tell me what I'm even doing, right? Really hard on my system because I don't know how, how good I'm operating, okay? Don't like the way this is set up. On the other side here on this right-hand side, actually looks pretty nice. Got, here's my pump coming up here. This is a, this is a vertical turbine pump, but it coming up here, coming out, got a pretty good run of straight pipe, I think here before we hit the T. And this is all out of the hydraulics book and everything gives a lot of good. Here's, an, here's our 90, first 90 here coming into a header, going back out. Looks really nice. Nice thing about this here, here's my, I have an air relief valve down here at the end, which is really, really a good idea because if there is any entrained air here and stuff like that, I can release it. And all of our air valves here and everything else uh, gives me a good idea. And, there, and there's uh, pressure gauges all in these boxes here all along here and stuff like that. So a lot of good stuff happening. So here's my first pump curve. We're gonna show you three pump curves here and stuff like that, and then get you some questions and stuff. So on this one here, this, if I was looking for something that was a hundred feet of total head and a thousand gallons per minute of flow, the two red lines intersect right here. And it tells me a lot of good information. I'm in that, first of all, I'm in that 85% range right here of my, of my pump curve, which is really good. 
Um, it tells me also that I should be, if I come back here, I should be in a, at least a 10 inch, tells me to use a 10 inch impeller, okay, for the pump that I'm, that I'm asking it to do. And I also, if I come back here, it tells me I should have at least a 30 horsepower pump, uh, motor or driver on there. Okay, so this one's pretty close right in the middle. So I, I like I like where I'm going here to the right hand side for my size of my motor, my left hand side for my size for my impeller. I look like I got a good flow for rate of flow for head and and for gallons per minute. So it looks pretty good. If this was shifted over a little bit, which I'll show you another one uh, coming up here, then I start to worry. It also tells me that inside inside this uh, area here that I'm at least at 12 foot of of that NPSH3 uh, or the R, which because it's 3% either way. And that's my net positive suction head required, okay? So I need at least 12 feet, which means if I need at least 12 feet, I add another five, I need 17 feet. So where am I pulling from? Where am I pumping to, all right? So those are all things I have to take into account. But this is a pretty, pretty decent curve, F fairly easy to read, all right? But this is typically what we get back out from the manufacturer. This is another one here. This is another one that says, hey, I'm looking for maybe like 42, 42 gallons per minute and, and, and about 118 feet of, uh, of total head, okay? And if you intersect those two, all right, you're right here on the line. So I'm still in, I'm in on this pump curve and it's 73, which is, which is where that says that the, that's their BEP point. That's my duty point. That's where I wanna be, all right? But I worry about some things here, and that and that is that I'm right on this line that's coming through here with the with with the size of motor. Okay, so it tells me, hey, you're right on the line there. So do you think I would stick with the two horse, or would I go over that line and go to the three horse or whatever? Right. So so that's one thing to think about. And then coming back here on this on this line here, I'm right at the I'm right at the line between eight and eight and a half you know, with that, with that. So I'd go bigger. And that's why I was saying, if you're getting close to that line, uh, I, I, I go to the next size just to play it safe. Okay. And then finally, here's a, here's a, a peerless one and stuff like that. And it's, a, it's another pretty good one and stuff. And as the, as the uh, things get uh, bigger and stuff like that, this name, this, this legend, as they call it up here in the right-hand corner is important because it tells you the size of the volute and everything, your impeller part number, pattern number, because we can change the the, the trim on the, you know, it's like buying a boat, uh, you know, if you have a boat or something like that, with an outboard motor, that 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 uh, propeller and stuff can be changed at pitch. Same thing on a fan in your house, I could change a pitch. Well, we could change a pitch here also. Then the eye size, telling you what the eye area is. And then this max sphere is one. And that's important because that tells you it's set up for one, which is viscosity of water. And that's, and that's what this is pumping. It's telling you it's pumping water. So this one here, again, I'm looking for a total dynamic head of 90 and 800 on the gallons per minute. It come up into here. And I'm right on the 83% line, which is which I think is still pretty good, okay? Like I said, my sweet spot, my perfect sweet spot's in the 85 on this one here, but the 83 is still pretty good, all right? And, so, and then it's telling me, hey, that my, my uh, net positive suction head is a minimum of six feet here, seven feet here, eight feet here, nine feet here. So it's telling me 10 feet. As it's going out, it's telling me how much I need. So I'm, I'm good, I'm saying, okay, I, I know what, my, what, what that is, so I'm good there, right? And then I come across here and, and figure this out. And this is a basic, super basic one. And it says, okay, and then when I come here, I come down here and it says I should have at least a 25 horsepower motor, okay? Which I think I'm okay, because I'm over just over the line here. So I'm feeling good about that. Feeling good about my, my net uh, positive uh, suction head here and stuff like that. So I'm good there. I like that. I'm gonna say eight feet because I'm getting close to it. So I'd say eight feet instead of seven, all right? And then um, at 83%, I'm good. And then I come back here and I should be a good at nine, a nine inch impeller, okay? So sometimes that these are questions that I would ask if, if, you're, if something happens to your uh, pump or something like that, it's just not to go ahead and just replace it and say to heck with it, but just, just, it's just something to think about, all right? This one here is just showing you that this is, this is nothing's on it. This is how they started out. This is the ISO side of it. And then they're going to fill in 
what you need, at, and, or you could do it yourself, let's say, and say, hey, I want 500 gallons per minute, all right, which is this line right here, and I need to have uh, 80 feet of, uh, no, 70 feet of head, all right? So I'd come across here to the 500, and know that would be right there, and I'm and I'm right in the I'm in the top end of my my sweet spot, right? And that does so much things for me, all right. So that a lot of good things there that you can do yourself before you even call them out and say, "Hey, I need, I need, I need," right? Know what you're asking for because the pump manufacturer and or the gent you're buying it from uh, will send you what you ask for. Okay, all righty. I hope you enjoyed this uh, uh, and I'll give it back to Ryan about any kind of questions or anything like that. Thank you so much, Ralph. We are getting a good selection of questions coming in and uh, I highly encourage any of you who are listening to to ask some questions and curiosities for, you know, the, the 15, 10, 15 minutes we have left here of the hour of, of this webinar. So we're getting some folks um, starting to answer questions. And again, you all uh, use the Q&A button instead of the chat. Uh, we're going to be only able to monitor that Q&A um, button so we can prioritize and, and, and put the questions in a format for the instructor. So thank you so much. So um, let's ask this first question here. Uh, one of our um, attendees, Ramiro, ha asks, do you tend to round down on the impeller size and then round up for horsepower, or is there another rule of thumb there? No, so so typically, yes, you would, you would round down and round up, um, but I always look at the curve, and I look at the curve to where if I'm half, half of the uh, impeller size, I'll go, I can go either way, but if I'm above the half point, way point, I usually go up on the impeller. Excellent. That sounds good. Um, so, uh, another attendee had a great point. This one here um, for that best efficiency point. Um, they're noticing that the most of the selections you were making were left of that best efficiency point on the curve, mm -hmm. um, whereas his organization tends to choose pumps that are to the right of that uh, instead. So that if the impeller wears efficiency improves, is that something you would recommend? Yes. Yeah, well, so so I always look at it in, in a couple of different ways. First of all, what am I pumping? Okay. If I'm pumping water, I tend to stay to the to the left. If I'm pumping chemicals or something uh, that's lighter than water, I go to the right because my flow curve changes. So that'd be my. That's what I would do. Okay. Excellent. Thank you so much. We're getting some good curiosities and questions. Mm -hmm. We're going to try to answer as many of these as we can, y'all. Um, seeing how many are coming in, we probably won't be able to get to all of them, but we're going to try our best. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so uh, just a quick comment maybe you'd like to um, pose for one of the attendees who who acknowledge uh, this is all about centrifugal pumps today, but mm -hmm. how do curves tend to change for a positive displacement pump in general? Sure. Yeah, so positive placement pump changes um, to where, it, again, what am I pumping? Because you, typically I'm pumping a slurry or something like that, all right? And that really changes the, the output of my pump because positive displacement is typically also on a variable speed, all right? So all of that, all of that um, uh, the pump curve changes because of what I pump. And I've always been that way, uh, and it's always worked out better for me instead of worrying worrying about horsepower or something like that. Um, and so it's what I pump. So if you're pumping a slurry or something like that, your your flow will go down. So you're going to be to the you're going to you're going to start having to worry about um, uh, where where are you going to be at 1800 RPM, all right, and then go back from there. Excellent. Uh, thank you so much, Ralph. And it, you all see here, by the way, just before we, you know, um, do close up shop, you, you have a number to call and you have an email, training.com to learn more about pumps. Again, uh, we're going to try to get to as many questions as you can, but if you want to continue learning more, uh, continue um, continue reaching out to us and we can continue getting your questions answered by more training or connecting you with one of our experts here like Ralph. So feel free. Um, let's see. Let's talk about next um, the NPSHR. 
that's the net positive suction head, if I recall. Yep, um, required, how, yeah. Can, can you review for this attendee who's curious about how they're used again on, on these curves? How is NPSH sure. used? So Feel free so, to flip back if you like to. Yeah, no, that's cool. So the, the uh, net positive suction head required, all right, mm -hmm. is the amount of water pressure that I need to, to hit the eye of the impeller prior to me turning the pump on because as I turn the pump on, I start creating a suction, all right, or, or a, a movement of water in that pipe on the suction side. If there's not enough there, then I start, I start cavitating. I start, there, there's, there, and there should be uh, at least five feet of water difference between what is required and what's available. So how about this? So if you took, I've seen a lot of pumps where they bring in a larger pipe and they bring it to a smaller pipe. So it's like sucking out of a straw, right? Mm -hmm. So what you can suck out of a straw is only so much, but depending on if, so what happens when I get down near the bottom of a, a drink, right? You hear that, right? right. At, when you're at the movies, right? <laughs> right. So, so um, that, that is the difference right there. So when I start doing that and I'm on that, my required is, 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 a difference between available and that's when I start sucking air or nothing, right? Mm. And, I, and I run into problems. Okay, uh, thank you so much. And let's see, um, we're getting some good detailed questions out here. Um, let's talk about the cavitation real quick. Someone mm -hmm. has a question about a cavitation. Let me see if I can find that one. Um, let's see. Can cavitation happen with flooded suction? It can. Okay, so it all depends on. So typically, we have a valve or something outside, outside to, to to isolate the pump, right? So if that valve starts to get close, it get closed in any way, right? Restriction, restriction in the pipe through a through a through a valve or through corrosion buildup in in the on the pipe itself. Okay, to where again, when my net positive suction head required to available starts to change, the pressures within the piping starts to change. So therefore cavitation starts to happen when there's a vapor change because it's gonna be like a boiling point, right? When I change from fluid to vapor, I, I go into a, into a, a little, um, a ball of air. I hate to say air because I never, I never wanna say it, but, but uh, the vapor. And when I come back through to the pump side, to where the impeller's at and stuff, I can now can relax because uh, I, I go back from a vapor to, to a liquid. That's when I implode. And when I implode is when I when where we have a problem and either break some or in pit, pits, pits pizza pieces of steel. So it's, it's actually, it could happen because of a restriction in the line. Absolutely. Gotcha. Um, we're getting a, a good amount of curiosity about pumps that might be going, um, paired with a VFD, a variable frequency drive, mm -hmm. a variable speed drive. Mm -hmm. um, I know, we, obviously, that's a whole other ball game there. But yeah. would you like to comment maybe on a general um, general way about how um, pumps with VFDs uh, and their pump curves might change? Sure. So it's kind of remember that that first or second one that we showed about the having a valve open or valve close. What happens? How about, forget about that being a valve. Let's just say it is speed. So I take, so typically what we do at VFD is what? We slow down the speed of the pump or the motor, the driver, in order to save money or whatever we want to do, better control, whatever, whatever it is, right? And so we slow that down. As we slow that down, things start changing. So if you, if you're, if you have a system that wants a hundred gallons per minute at, at 50, feet of head, all right? And you slow this down to 50 gallons per minute, okay? At 50 feet of head, because you still got to pump to the same place, okay? Your pump curve starts to change and goes to one way or the other off the best efficiency point. So if you are going to buy a pump or set up a pump that's a variable speed, I would look at not at 1800 RPM, what speed are you going to be doing it at? Or better yet, what speed are, what, how many gallons per minute do you need, right? So if you know what that is, you can 
properly set, uh, put that in there. And the and the the curve is the same type of curve with the ISO lines and stuff like that. It's just going to put you at a different a different wave because you might not need a big the a, let's say it says it on a the one we just looked at said, hey, you need a 25 horsepower motor, right? But for what you're going to be doing with the VFD and stuff, you might only need a 15 horse motor. So it changes your motor size. It changes a little bit of everything. So just a different way of looking at the curve. Gotcha. Yeah, I would definitely have a lot of people curious about variable speed pumps. And I would kind of clarify that we get more into detail on those in a, you know, a full two day course where we have more room to, to cover them. Uh, some folks are talking about how efficiency changes at the variable speed, how how the pump curve changes, which I think you hit on right here with their mm -hmm. answer to their question. Mm -hmm. um, let's see, I think we have about five minutes left together. Let's see if we can answer maybe one or two more. Right. Um, how about a review on deadheading a pump. Um, okay. We want to comment on what's going on with deadheading a pump, and is that shown on the on the pump curve or not? It is. So the deadheading's all the way at the at the one side of the either either because of height, let's say, right? So let's say the total dynamic head on this pump is a uh, is a, 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 the sub pump we talked about, right? Ten feet. At ten feet, I have no more flow. Right. Mm -hmm. So that's one way of deadheading. The other way of deadheading, uh, which uh, is worse, is is closing off a valve to it or something like that. Right. Yeah. And my pump's going to my pump's going to run and it goes to that, to that valve that's closed or whatever. And it just sits there and circulates. Right. Problem is, it's just going to start heating up. So when I when, and as I heat up, I, I start cooking whatever's inside there. So if it's gasoline, that's bad. Right. But if it's just water, it's just going to boil. It's going to go up and start boiling. Right. So that's why if you ever go to your pumps and put your hand on your pump and it's warm above the touch, because it's only supposed to be 68 degrees. Right. Uh, uh, you have a problem. OK. It's, and then I start looking at at gauges because I'm telling you from brand new. If you take your gauges and start marking down what what am I doing? You know, you have a, some type of flow meter saying, hey, I'm pumping. 100 gallons per minute. Okay, good. What is my pressure at my discharge and stuff? Because as things change, as you go down in speed or something like that, this is very important with a variable speed, you need to know the pressures that are happening with inside your system. Okay. And that way you can you can pretty much dial in the, the BEP or that sweet spot with the gauges and stuff like that. And again, if you take, if you know total dynamic head that's on your pump. If it's if it's a hundred feet and and you divide that by two point three one, it's going to give you the number of psi that you should have on your gauge. That tell you if it's in a sweet spot because I'm you bought this pump to do a hundred feet and everything else or whatever it is. That that is what's supposed to be there. And if it's, if it's thirty, it's, it says uh, hey, it's 27, 27 psi. That's that's exactly what you should have. Okay, fine. So suppose it's less. Not in, then you're off the then you're off your sweet spot. A lot of things come when it when it when it comes to setting up pumps and everything. Definitely. Um, last thing I'd, I'd ask you, I've got a couple of questions on this one, and then I think we're going to call it a day. And that is, um, what are your thoughts on a submersible pump? Um, what the curve looks like, um, how the gallons per minute might be based. Is it based on total dynamic head, static, or, mm -hmm. or something else? Um, anything else you want to comment on submersible sure. pumps in particular? Okay. So submersible pumps are, are kind of uh, off the side, right? Because submersible pump is sitting in the liquid already, whatever it's going to pump, right? And then it's going to come up and over. So you're going to look at total on that one for sure total dynamic head and look at your pressure gauge on the outside right because first thing that typically happens is you're going to have some type of check valve in there so it doesn't come back into the pump and everything right and the thing about a submersible pump especially if it's three phase it could run backwards and still pump it's just not going to pump where it's supposed to be so that's why you have to have that gauge there to say hey because how do you know well people look at it and say hey okay i checked it before and it's and it's working right and but a lot of people don't they just throw it down in there like oh man i gotta get it out of there and check it again so we check it by looking at the pressure gauge right and all your pressure gauges should have a i would not go with one that's in line right with liquid and i would do something with uh, uh some type of diaphragm or something like that because you're going to get stuff into your gauge that freezes it up or t tends it not to be accurate all right gotta have an accurate gauge 
So submersible pumps, great, great. Uh, one of the easiest things that we could do to put in there and stuff. But in order for you to be able to push it up and out, you've got to make sure about piping size, pressure on the gauge, and is it going the right, correct way, uh, you know, rotation wise. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, Ralph, for, for sharing your wisdom with us. And thank you, everyone, for being here today. We really appreciate you spending your hour with us learning a little bit more about pumps. So um, we definitely feel free to give us a call if you have any more questions about how to learn more about pumps and pump curves and mechanical systems in general. Have a great day and thanks so much.